conduct our processes with a prescribed uh, legislative framework. Firstly, is the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. We've got Section 217, which talks to the fairness, equitability, transparency, cost effectiveness, and cost and competitiveness of our procurement processes. Meaning to say, as we execute procurement function, we are obligated to make sure that whatever that we are doing, it's fair, it's equitable, there's transparency, competitiveness, and cost effective. If you read in between the lines, you will see lots of words that have been used there, which calls again for a broader understanding. We're talking about fairness, we're talking about competitiveness, we're talking about equitability. When you look at that, there have to be competition, there have to be equi equitability, and there have to be cost effectiveness. You look at those, how do we strike the balance as, as public sector supply chain management practitioners? Section 217, uh, subsection two, I've already referred to it in the previous slide, which talks to the category of persons and protection or advancement of persons or categories of persons disadvantaged by unfair discrimination. You'll bear with me or agree with me that South Africa, we have our own history where we cannot divorce ourselves from what the apartheid regime has done into our country. So as procurement, we need to see how best do we use procurement to make sure those unfair treatment that were done by the apartheid era, how do we address that? How do we redress that? But within the ambits of the law. Public Finance Management Act, Act number one of 1999 is amended by Act 29 of 1999. In this case, the Public Finance Management Act has just been promulgated to regulate financial management in the national and provincial sphere of government. It also assigned powers, considerable powers to accounting officers and accounting authorities to enable them to manage their financial affairs within the parameters of prescribed norms and standards. In public sector, what we're saying is, we must be able to account for each and every cent that we have spent. If we've got resources that we need to manage, at the end of the day, you manage, there is accountability, there is responsibility, which has been bestowed upon the accounting officers and the accounting authorities. The Preferential Procurement Framework Act, number five of 2000, is giving effect into to section 2172 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. It's giving a regime, it has opened a regime of preferential treatment of those designated groups of persons or individuals or categories of people who were disadvantaged in the previous uh, apartheid regime. You will recall with me, for us to redress, that have to be regulated, that have to be guided, so that at the end of the day, we don't find ourselves talking about redress, but at the same time, operating outside the ambits of the law. Now, coming to the game changer regulation in terms of my own understanding, the preferential procurement regulations of 2017. I regard this as a game changer and I will, I will, I will state my case in this regard. A game changer in a manner that it unlocked certain areas which were gray, which were not clear from the Preferential Procurement Policy Framework Act. It break down into practical implementable terms. Like for example, you look at uh, regulation four, one and two. It allows us as government officials or as SCM uh, uh, practitioners to set a pre-qualification of bids. We can say for this particular bid, only 
enterprises that are uh, 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 BEE level one or two or three. Meaning that when we go on advert, we specify that and anybody or any entity which is outside that, that framework that we have provided, outside the triple BEE that we have outlined there, will not be eligible to, to tender. And this gives us a space to empower certain designated groups or persons. Regulation 9, 1, and 2. I'm calling it again a game changer because it's allowing us legally so to implement subcontracting. You award a tender, but in or you arrange or advertise a tender, but in that in, inside that tender, you, we are allowed to do subcontracting. And it's also regulated in terms of how that should be executed. And I find this again. It is a game changer because previously, before regulations of 2017, it was difficult to implement this. Regulation 11, 1, and 2. It also allows us to award contracts to tenderers. We have not scored the highest point. This is about objective criteria. And previously, it has been difficult for you to do this. You have to be creative. And many people who have been paid within supply chain management space have been sitting with a lot of challenges because you are moving outside the ambits of the law. So therefore, I regard these preferential procurement regulations of 2017 as a game changer to our supply chain management environment and also the beginning of the start where supply chain will be well regulated, not only for compliance purposes, but be used as an enabling tool for us to advance social economic imperatives using public sector procurement. The purpose of public procurement. Today, if you look at how we use public procurement colleagues, you'll agree with me. It has been broadened and I will take you through why I'm saying this. The purpose therefore is to purchase goods and services at a reasonable cost from appropriate suppliers without compromising standard of quality. Very key, appropriate suppliers without compromising the quality of standards or the standard of quality. Again, the purpose of public procurement is to acquire the right item at the right time with the right price and such items be delivered at the right place. If you look at the, 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 the authors, you can tell there have been a well thought exercise in terms of how do we make sure that the purpose of public procurement is set out in such a way that it's be, it be explicitly clear in terms of what is it that we expect out of public sector procurement. Listen at the third point. Public procurement, it's used as a policy tool to address socioeconomic imbalances. I've shared this with you. Why do I put this, uh, colleagues? I'm putting this back here because it is very much important for us to take it, to internalize it in ourselves that as we implement procurement, it's not only about buying that commodity. It's not only about delivering or building that road or constructing that clinic or school. Out of it, we have to, to look at how do we best use that procurement of that particular commodity to address socioeconomic imperatives within the space we find ourselves in. I like the third one by uh, Ramanujan. He says to ensure that all interested suppliers are aware of tender opportunities and they are all treated the same without bias, without favor, 
without prejudice. This is very much important comment. As much as we want to go and procure those particular services, as much as we want it to be delivered at the right, at the right price, right item, correct item, delivered at the right place, we need to make sure that when we go out in the market seeking for service providers who will deliver these services, we are guided by two clear principles. Treating them fairly, equally, without prejudice. Because if you violate that rule, you are what a tender, you are in the media for all the wrong reasons. So we are guided in supply chain. What is very much important, practitioners are obliged to ensure that the above objectives or the above purpose is achieved within the confines of the legislative framework regulating public sector procurement. Now, I'm coming to the most interesting space in terms of sharing a practitioner's perspective which is experience-based. This is one of the, the work that we have done at Limpopo Provincial Treasury at a transversal point of view. Hence, it was indicated by Ayanda that I'm attached to transversal contract management. For us to leverage strategic procurement, in order to enhance the execution of government projects towards inclusive growth, you'll agree with me, colleagues. It requires a business unusual approach. We cannot talk about using public procurement as a lever towards inclusive growth if we still continue with doing things the same way, the way we have been doing before. We need to start turning around and look at upon ourselves. How best do we make sure that public procurement, the money that is spent or disbursed through public procurement, contribute to the socioeconomic dynamics of our space? The first one, we need to locate the strategic intent of each commodity prior going on tender. What I'm saying here is, I said it has to be business unusual. When we, we have to locate a strategic intent, we need to ask ourselves, with this particular commodity that we intend to go out on tender, which objective do we want it to achieve? Do we want to use it as, as, a, as a project for empowerment purpose? Do we want to use this as a, a, a project for cost saving? And both of these, to answer these questions, colleagues, you can use a thumb sucking approach. You have to involve extensive research. In other words, for you to locate a strategic intent for a commodity prior going on tender, research becomes an inevitable concept. This is what we, we, have, been, we, we have done from experience-based approach. When we, at, we arranged some transversal contracts, we ask ourselves questions. What is it that we want these transversal contracts to achieve? For us to, uh, to arrive there, we have to conduct a research. We have to understand the role players in the market. Who are these role players? To start with, do we have them? in the industry to provide the commodity that we want to go out in tender, on tender for. Where are they located, their location? Are they role players inside the country, in the province, in our districts? Because in our space, we've got districts. Limpopo have got five districts. So as we do research, we need to reflect on our provincial dynamics. Where are they located? Are they outside Limpopo? Are they abroad, outside the boundaries of South Africa? We also need to look at their area of specialization. You know they can register on CSD, 
claiming to do everything, but we need to ascertain ourselves. When we go out on tender, these service providers that we are looking at, do they understand, do they specialize in this commodity or what's happening in their operations? We also need to look at work experience. We checked work experience and we also used an approach that is giving us evidence and confirmation that they've got the work experience that we want. The other critical point that we have to ascertain ourselves is their BEE, status level of contributor. Which level are they? And also, we need to understand which designated groups are they falling under or categories of persons? Are they youth? Are they women? Are they people living with disabilities? Are they military uh, 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 veterans? We needed to check this. Are they coming from rural communities? We need to look at this because remember, when you want to use procurement as a lever towards inclusive growth, you need to make sure that at the end of the day, you've got a broader understanding of the dynamics of the commodity you are going into. This includes the regulatory bodies. Are there any affiliations? Out of these colleagues, we have to come back and answer a question. Now that we have collected, collected this information, then how do we locate a strategic intent of this commodity? I'll give you an example. We did this with uh, travel management services. We've got a, a transversal contract for travel management services. We, also, we have also done this also to commercial banking services. And when you look after we've done at all this research and avail this information, we're able to go back to our principals and say, out of this particular contract or these commodities, we can be able to do the pre-qualifications. Why? Because we have done a thorough research. We have checked the role players in the industry the BEE status level of contributor of those role players. And we also tested the feasibility of subcontracting because the regulation says we're feasible. We looked at the commodity. We looked at how we've been consuming this commodity before we had a transversal contract. And we make a determination. It is feasible to do subcontracting. And out of this colleagues, you also need to deploy a broader consultative trajectory. It's not about researching. After researching, then we go out on tender. There are critical stakeholders within our institutions that we need to engage. We have to take an extensive time again to consult broadly within our space so that at the end of the day, whatever that we want to make sure that we are putting out on tender, we, we are moving in one space as Limpopo provincial government in terms of where we are going. You don't have to, you don't want to see a situation whereby you advertise a bid upon advertisement of a bid, you are questioned by one of your own with the same institution or, or own government. It, that will tell you consultative approach was not brought enough. Hence, the process of arranging a transversal contract, colleagues, is not a process that happens overnight. It takes a bit of a longer period because these have to be taken care of. If you don't do this, it will be very difficult for you to claim that we are using public sector procurement to drive inclusive growth or to use it to, to drive towards economic transformation. For you to do this, colleagues, our tender processes have to be preceded by extensive research. I've spoken about, I'll take you a little bit backwards. I've spoken about an extensive research where you will determine your strategic intent. 
after you have decided in terms of your strategic intent, you would have come to say out of this bid, this is our strategic intent. We want to use this bid or this commodity, the procurement of this commodity to advance or protect certain designated groups. We want to use this commodity or this bid for subcontracting, for empowerment purposes. All these colleagues, as well as cost savings, all these have to be clearly expressed in our bid document. We had to make sure that when a bidder look at the bid advertisement itself, it sets out the pre-qualification from that point. When they get the, when they access our bid document, when they go through our terms of reference or specifications, it have to be clear, aligned to the objectives or strategic intent that we wanted this bid to achieve. Same is evaluation criteria. You'll, you'll agree with me. You will set your evaluation criteria. If your evaluation criteria is not informed by what's happening in the market, but what's happening in terms of the role players in the industry, you are standing a chance to advertise a bid. And upon evaluation, you realize none of your bidders are meeting the technical evaluation uh, uh, requirement that we have been set. Within supply chain management space, when we put out technical evaluation, which is commonly known as functionality, we set a minimum requirement to say, bidders, in, for them to be tested, functional or responsive, they must meet certain points. Quite often you'll find 60 points, 70 points, or 80 points. This tells that if you only thumb sucked the functionality, the scores that you put there, the weights that you put there, the likelihood you're gonna go back and cancel the bid because you did not find the responsive bidders. This calls that before we set the technical evaluation criteria, we have to make sure that we have done a research. We understand what's happening there in terms of their experience, in terms of the level of persons we want to protect, we want to advance in terms of the designated groups. Also, when we craft our service level agreement, we had to ensure that when somebody goes through our service level agreement, you will get a synchronization between our service level agreement and our strategic intent. Because if the two, they are not in sync, the implementation of that particular contract will be a mess. It won't assist you to achieve your strategic intent. Same is the service levels. Here colleagues, I'm sharing with you the objectives that we achieved through the transversal contracts that we, we arranged. I'll, I'll be talking more specifically on travel management services and also commercial banking services. We managed to save costs. When you go through competitive bidding at a transversal space, colleagues, you save costs in terms of how bidders are bidding. They understand we're sitting at a space where we've got a buying power. It's not a contract or commodity where only one institution will participate. In our case, it's all 11 de provincial departments and also our public uh, entities. So service providers, where they bid, because we also disclose how much is involved in terms of our budget for this particular commodity, they know there is a, a, a bargaining power from government. And as they bid, they have to take that into consideration. And we have seen since a lot of savings towards government. Number two, in our transversal contracts, apart from acquiring the service, apart from appointing a provincial banker to render a service, we saw an opportunity there that the service providers, the, the banking sector, they can be able to support us as government in providing funding for SMEs. As I'm talking to you today, 
we've got two programs that are offered by two commercial banks geared towards funding our SMMEs. I'm talking about SMMEs who would have been awarded contracts, be it through uh, formal contracts or quotations. But these SMMEs, they don't have finance. They don't have the financial muscle to execute such contract. And as the Mpopo provincial government, we sat back and say, but there is an opportunity. If we can use this transversal contract to drive socioeconomic change in our, in our space, we can be able to make this one of the key issues that they need to assist us on. And as I'm speaking today, there are a lot of service providers who have been able to be given uh, finance by the commercial banks to fund their contractual obligations. And our point as provincial government is, if an SMME is awarded government contract for certain behind that award letter that's money, meaning that if a service provider is without finance to execute that contract, as Limbobo Provincial Treasury, we regard that as a missed opportunity. And we felt we've got a role to play. So you can look at it and say, inclusive growth, it's a broad concept, which we need to make effort as government, which we need to make effort as SEM practitioners to make sure that we use our, our, our uh, public uh, procurement as a means towards that. Also, out of the transversal contracts, we manage to support sectors that are in distress. And recall, we don't go on tender for the purpose of supporting sectors that are in distress, for the purpose of SMME funding. We want commercial banking services, but out of it, we say there is an opportunity we can use this contract to support sectors in distress. As I speak, already we have supported some school children or learners who are without school uniform. And you, you look at how that switch on the light of a learner when one day he or she wake up, government have come with its business partners to donate school uniform. What does it mean towards creating a conducive environment for teaching and learning through the transversal contract, meaning that we have used public procurement to enhance the culture of teaching and learning by making sure that we support, we buy uniform for our learners. And also, again, we manage to protect certain categories or advance certain categories. When we went on tender for travel management services, what we did, we made a pre-qualification requirement as a minimum requirement of bid, meaning that we protected and advanced certain designated groups and disqualifying those that were not falling in that space. This is informed by the very exercise that we did, research, because it enabled us to make a determination which BEE status of level contributor we want to advance, we want to protect. Again, we implemented subcontracting. Instead of awarding a contract to only one service provider or two service providers. We ended up in one contract. We've got two main contractors and we also have six subcontractors, meaning in totality, instead of awarding it to one service provider, we awarded to eight service providers. So when you look out of this, you can tell we've got a lot of space as SCM practitioners to use public procurement as a lever towards inclusive growth. And this I'm sharing, what I'm sharing with you, it's based on the practical experience which we have executed as transversal contract in the Mpopo Provincial Treasury. 
And for us to do this, colleagues, I will repeat it again. When bidders go through our tender document, our bid document, they must see a clear expression of these elements from our bid document. Because without that, there will be challenges towards what you will experience challenges as you are evaluate challenges, challenges also when you execute the contract. The other aspect is within the Mpopo province, we created a discourse or a platform for SEM practitioners. I'm talking about practical, practical experience of what we, we, we are doing. We are having a platform where heads of SCM sits on quarterly basis. Heads of SCM for all provincial departments and the public entities support 11 provincial departments and five public entities. So here we sit and engage on SCM related issues. If I were to borrow a word, it's this is where iron sharpens another iron. We share our experiences and we give advices. One of the aspects that we're reporting about is the procurement spend. In terms of out of what we, 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 we're dispersing through public procurement within the province, how might circulate within the bubble? And when we started reporting on this, we realized that over 60% of our provincial spend it goes outside the province. And that calls for an introspection. How do we make sure the provincial budget that has been allocated, how do we strive to ensure that it circulates within the province, but circulating within the province, within the ambit of the law, excuse me. And this engagement, creating that platform, creating that discourse that has changed the trajectory altogether. And we're able to see provincial budget benefiting our local SMEs. And the, the question is, how will that so? How will that happen? Such discourse, colleagues, goes a long way in changing the mindset of ourselves to, to start with as practitioners to start building it amongst ourselves. Each time we call out for quotations, we have that in mind to say, how do we ensure out of these quotations, we make sure that there's a beneficiation to our local SMEs wherever possible. Because without that, we can't shake the socioeconomic dynamics within our space. Again, what we did in the province, because we are sharing also some practices, we had sessions in 2016, 2017, we arranged a strategic SCM workshop where we called in together heads of SCM, not only for provincial departments and public entities, but municipalities included. That strategic workshop ended up like an introspection. We break out into commissions whereby we had different topics to engage. And out of that, there were some recommendations which were made. What I'm saying is for us to be enabled to contribute towards inclusive growth, we can do that holistically if we don't have a session or a platform where we do an introspection, where we measure where we are, what is it that we lack, where do we improve? Again, in the year 2017-2018, Office of the Premier appointed a service provider and its sole mandate was to evaluate procurement strategies in the province for selected commodities and Limpopo Provincial Treasury once more was not outside that project. We were hands-on on that project. When the project was completed, we looked at the recommendations and we say, 
good shot. This is an opportunity. How do we make sure that the recommendations that were made by a service provider to do evaluations within our space, which is procurement, how do we make sure we follow them through to make sure that at the end of the day, they are executed. They are part and parcel of our going discourse. And the following were amongst the recommendations, common recommendations, which the two exercises made. One was capacity building of SCM practitioners. Capacity building of SMMEs and also automation of SCM processes. When I talk about the strategic SCM workshops, it was we were not only talking to ourselves by ourselves. We invited external stakeholders from the academic perspectives. We had also SIPs in attendance. We also had AG in attendance just to assist us in terms of how do we make sure that we improve our perspectives on supply chain management. Capacity building. I'm linking back to the recommendations that I spoke to in the previous slide. You will agree with me, colleagues. We can talk about inclusive growth. We can talk about economic transformation. We can talk about the regimes that are have taking place every day with regard to reforms within public, uh, public sector procurement space. But if there is a disjuncture between what we are talking about and the level of knowledge from those that are critical role players, that will remain another, yet another pie in the sky. Meaning that as much as we talk about inclusive growth, economic transformation, as well as the, 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 the reforms within the public sector space, we need to make sure that we capacitate continuously, and I'll repeat continuously, our SCM practitioners so that they have a broader understanding of public sector procurement and its dynamics. This is what we're doing in Limpopo. On a quarterly basis, Limpo, through Limpopo Provincial Treasury, we conduct workshops and training of SCM officials and also facilitate other training programs that are offered by uh, the NSG. And this is a concerted effort, a deliberate concerted effort by Limpopo Provincial Treasury to take a lead in driving capacity building for we know if we don't do that, it will be very difficult to achieve inclusive growth. Again, capacity building towards our SMMEs. You will agree with me, colleagues. SMMEs are at the center of public sector procurement. We don't deliver goods and services by ourselves. We appoint SMMEs. So as much as we want to talk about subcontracting, we want to empower military veterans, we want to empower women, we want to empower youth, we want to use public procurement to drive socioeconomic change. If our SMMEs are not taken up in terms of making sure that they understand where government is coming from, where government is currently at, and where government is heading to, it will be very difficult, colleagues, to achieve what you want to achieve. You set the pre-qualifications, they come and demonstrate against it because they were not part, they did not understand, they were not involved. Therefore, it's very much important to make sure that our SMMEs are capacitated to understand government programs. With regard to automating SCM processes, like I've indicated, we looked at some of the recommendations that were made by a study that was conducted in the province. And we, we made a decision that we need to put together a team that will look at automating procurement processes in the province. And given the limited financial resources that we have, 
we have as government, not the Bobo provincial government alone. We had to look at how can we best have this done by using local available resources that we have in our midst. And as I'm speaking to you, we've got experts within the IT space in our provincial departments that are part of the task team in terms of process mapping, designing the system that we can use as Limpopo provincial government for procurement purposes. You will agree with me once more colleagues. COVID-19 has exposed us as government. When COVID-19 hits, when hard lockdown was pronounced, we, 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 we had a lot of challenges before us as supply chain management practitioners. We had bids that were advertised. We had bids that were supposed to advertise. We had bids that were supposed to close there immediately. But the question was, for the bids that we want to advertise, how will our SMMEs access tender documents or bid documents? For those that are just about to close, how are we going to receive these bid documents? Because traditionally, you'll agree with me, we are advertising them, the, the, the tenders, they access the tender documents, they complete the tender documents, they must come and deposit it in the tender box. Now there's COVID in the mix. That was a big spanner that was thrown into the works. And we, we could not get it in terms of how do we respond to this? We had a lot of tenders that the closing dates have to be extended. One extension to the other. Even receiving of quotations, they have to deposit them in the box. Some they have to send them. When, when you look at how do we make sure why we want to execute this procurement function, how do we protect SCM practitioners who are supposed to go to the tender, document, tender box, open the tender box, receive the tender document, go page by page. You will recall some of most of the tenderers when they submit bid, their bid documents, they submit on the 11th hour, meaning that they deposit it into the tender box just two minutes before 11 o'clock, you open it. If that document is, contem is, is contaminated by the virus, what do you do as a, a supply chain management a practitioner to protect yourself against that? Yet there is a lot of opportunities that information technology environment provides to us. Hence, I'm saying we were very pretty exposed as government. And this is still an area which we need to, to, to expedite. Because if we do not expedite, we don't have timelines. It's not COVID-19, it's not a project. We do not know where it's going to end. We're still sitting with it. There's a third wave coming. We don't know whether there will be a fourth wave. So if we don't move up with speed to sort out the automation of SEM processes again, to use public sector procurement as a lever towards inclusive growth might remain another phenomenon that we are using in a closed boardroom, but we are not able to implement. I also indicated that one of the aspects that we are sharing in the platform, Supply Chain Management Forum, where we're sitting with all heads of SEM uh, for provincial departments and public entities, we are looking at our provincial procurement targets. How are we faring? Just to give a snapshot on it, you will, this, this is a document or information that I'm sharing with pride in terms of what we're doing in the province. We are not yet there, but we, we are on a step towards a right direction. Because if you do not have targets that are informed by your own provincial procurement strategy, then you are hitting nowhere. You're just shooting another bullet in the sky. We have got designated groups. We've got blacks, we've got youth, we've got women. We've got persons with disability. We've got cooperatives. We've got military veterans. We've got SMMEs. We've got uh, service providers that are located in rural areas. 
If you look at the total spend, that is for 2020, 2021 financial year. For Blacks, we had 8.3 billion. That amounts to 57.2%. And the set target in terms of the Limbobo procurement strategy, we set a target of 60, 60%. And that is a strategy 2030 strategy. And we are at 57.2% in terms of 2020 and 2021 financial year. With regard to the youth, we've got 1.7 billion that was spent, it's 11.6%. And that is uh, our target is 20. Women is 2.7 billion. Target that we have achieved, it's 18.6. And the third target in terms of our LPS or Limpopo Procurement Strategy 2030 is 20%. Persons with disability, we've got 45 million that have spent towards them. In terms of the target, target that we have achieved, the actual, target, the actual achievement, it's 0.3%, yet we have 7% that we have set as a target. Contracts that went to cooperatives. Total spend is 28 million. And the percentage there is 0 0.2. And our set target is 10%. Military veterans, we spent 46.1 million. That amount to 0.3%. And our target is 3%. SMMEs. It's 7.9 billion that has been spent over 2020, 2021 financial year, that amounting to 54.7%. And the third target in terms of our Limpopo procurement strategy, it's 65%. Service providers or SMEs in rural areas, we spent 2.6 billion, that amounts to 18.3%. And the third target there is 5%. If you look at that, colleagues, imagine we're sitting in a space whereby we reflect, report, and discuss these issues, these matters, at a platform where all provincial uh, heads of SCM are sitting, including the public entities. The impact of this conversation the awareness drive that it sets to all of us as practitioners to make efforts towards this, because immediately you will ask yourself as a, a practitioner within SM space, the quotations that we are going out, what is the objective there? The tenders that are going out, what is the objective there? Are they geared towards assisting us to realize our set Limpopo procurement strategy 2018? which the object, the, the, the goals there or the targets are clear. But like we say, it's 2030. And when we look at that, we are proud, we are not discouraged, but it's talking to us in terms of what do we need to do to make sure that at the end of the day, we see more military veterans getting into the space. We see more co-ops getting into the space. We see more persons with disability get into the space because it's not only about the reports. It's about asking ourselves, how do we improve? So by sharing this kind of information, the, 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 the practice that I'm putting, the best practice that I'm putting is by sharing this at that provincial uh, space, at that forum, it assists a great deal in conscientizing, in raising awareness. So if all provincial treasury departments can be in a position to share this information, to, to always drive this awareness to all SCM practitioners to say, hey, this is where we are going and this is where we are. Remember, we need to use public procurement to drive inclusive growth. So sharing this kind of, creating this kind of platforms where this kind of information is shared, it's got a massive, benefit towards the society. Okay. In terms of the challenges, 
towards inclusive growth using strategic procurement, number one. We are expected as supply chain to drive inclusive growth, yet we still have glaring challenges of vacant posts within SCM. It's like you want this car to drive as fast as possible, but you remove the engine. How do we then respond? How do we get, how do we find ourselves responsive if we still have vacant positions? I'm not talking about vacant positions for low positions. I'm talking about vacant positions, those positions that are key in driving public sector procurement forward. We're also sitting with challenges whereby SM officials constantly, they are shifted. Today, you are at this particular unit, you are hidden. Six months down the line, you have been moved. And some of them, you cannot divorce from the changes within the political space. As our political masters move from one department to the other, you sometimes see the shift and which you understand, you cannot divorce politics from administration. That is the political administration dichotomy that we find ourselves in. But that does not make us shy away from executing responsibilities such before us. Legislative bottlenecks, and I will qualify it why I call it legislative bottlenecks. We so wish as supply chain management uh, practitioners that legislation one day cannot only be used as a matter of compliance, but can be used as an enabler. And I will talk to this again. Enabler in this sense. We, we need to see our legislation allowing us, if we want to say, we want to reinforce this budget, towards people with disability. Our legislation should allow that, should allow us to do that. But within the confines of the law, we are struggling now to, to make a movement, quick movement, in terms of uh, reaching out to military veterans, reaching out to uh, co-ops, reaching out to youth, reaching out to, 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 to women. And if you look back where we're coming from when we started with procurement before we get to supply chain management uh, 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 regime, we were allowed to ring first certain budget towards empowering certain designated groups. So if we can get to a space whereby our legislation can be more of an enabler and move with a space that it requires, we require. We can be able to reinvest certain budget and we say for this budget that we've put aside, it's only for these designated groups. In, in, such, in such manner, we'll be able to make massive progress to what we set before us in terms of the society seeing public procurement fit for purpose, be it, it used for what it's designed for. It's not by default colleagues, that section 217 have got subsection two there for preferences. It's not, by, it's not by default, that is by design. But we need to go, our legislation must go a step further, more from where we are in terms of the regulations of 2017. We need to take it a step further so that we can use it, start using it as an enabler, not only for compliance purposes. Another uh, 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 dilemma that we found ourselves in, striking a balance between cost saving and empowerment. You will agree with me, colleagues. We are sitting in a space now where public financial resources are depleted every day. They are diminishing, I mean to say, every day. But when you look at the needs of the society, it's dynamic is ever growing day by day. And at the same time, we need to deal with empowerment. So the, these are the challenges that we find ourselves as supply chain management practitioners, as we want to drive 
our processes towards inclusive growth, we have certain issues that we need to deal with. The other point that is very critical, not having functional demand management units. Demand management, that is where the planning phase of procurement happens. That is where the strategic intent of procurement is determined. That's where research takes place so that it inform the procurement methodology that's gonna be deployed going into the market. So if we don't have functional demand management units, you will agree with me, it will remain a thorn in the flesh for government to talk with our shoulders squared up high that we are driving public procurement uh, function towards inclusive growth because inclusive growth require thorough planning. Without planning, you need to forget about inclusive growth. But be that as it may, we are trying as government, it's not all lost. Looking at the proposed recommendations, in order to leverage strategic procurement to enhance the execution of government projects towards inclusive growth, look at the following. One, we need to have a thorough research prior going on tender. I'm not talking about a research which will start today because we want to go on tender next month. No, that is not research. That I call it window dressing research. You will mislead the process. I'm talking about a research which you engage far in advance in preparation for the tender that you want to go on. Number two, we need to locate a strategic intent of each commodity before we go on bidding processes. Before we advertise, we need to be clear what strategic intent have we set for this particular bid. And the other critical point, whatever strategic intent that we have located for that particular bid, we need to make sure that such it's it's clearly expressed in our bid document. I've indicated in the earlier slides, as we advertise, we go on advert, our terms of reference, our evaluation criteria, including the technical evaluation, and also service level agreement and service levels have to be explicit. And we have done this as provincial treasure. And it have assist us, assisted us a great deal. Also, critical is to create a provincial discourse or a platform where heads of SCM are sitting together, engaging on SCM related activities. That's where ION will sharpen another iron. We had issues whereby departments will ask questions and a department asks a question, another department gives a solution. And you tell, as long as we don't pollinate we're sitting in silos, it will be very much difficult to use public procurement as a lever towards inclusive growth. So that discourse, that platform remains critical. Continuous capacity building for SEM officials and SMMEs. We can talk about all the transformations and all the reforms. If we don't capacitate ourselves, we don't up our skill to that level of what we're talking about. It's a pie yet in a sky that we cannot set our hands on. We can only see. The other aspect is professionalization of SAM. Colleagues, professionalization of SCM, it goes a long way. Not only with regard to the knowledge base, but commanding the respect that we deserve. You will agree previously, a, an official who's not performing well in one unit, they will transfer that person to procurement. And that tells you the level at which supply chain 
space was viewed or procurement space was viewed. But the moment we start to move it towards professionalization, that will command our area a respect and it will be regarded as a profession that will be professing as supply chain management officials. And in the province, we have already started some programs, which is towards the professionalization of SEM, which is driven by uh, uh, my chief director, Ms. Betty Rakum, in terms of making sure that in the province, we are making strides, we are making concerted efforts to make sure that SEM officials are moving towards a professionalization space. Conclusion, I've said this before, colleagues. We are not there as yet, but we need to start thinking outside the box. We need to do things differently, unlike what we used to do before. The regimes that we see, the reforms that we see within the public sector space must give us hope. If we talk about procurement regulations of 2017, prayer that we never thought that regime will come. Now it has arrived. Now we're talking about uh, trade, uh, the, 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 the regulations that are coming through as well. And we needed to make sure that we use that as a source of strength to say, as long as re uh, reforms are a continuous exercise in treasury, one day we will get there, our legislation, we will become an enabler. If we started with regulations of 2017, surely we'll get there. Let us continue with this discourse, colleagues. Because if we don't continue with this discourse, whereby the, the, the research institutions like ASCA is giving us a platform to share the good that we are doing as government. If we don't do that, then we are equally perpetuating the narrative, which is negative about SCM. If we don't showcase the good of what we are doing, those who are critical of our process, the media, and any other person will take the stage and talk negative about SEM processes. Yet we know we are sitting there. We don't even, we know the time to get to work as supply chain managers, uh, as, uh, practitioners, but we don't know the time to lock off because of the amount of work. Yet we don't have a space where we can showcase what we are doing, the good work that we are doing. And I'm saying, if we don't do that, if we don't create that space, if we don't partner with research institutions like ISCA to showcase the good that we are doing, I can assure you, we'll continue to read negative narrative about public sector supply chain. Expedite legislative reforms. This is a wish from my side and we engaging with national treasury, we engaging with all stakeholders that are, that are relevant to legislative reforms. And as Limpopo Provincial Treasury, we are making sure time and again, when there are movements towards legislative reforms, we are part of it and we engage and national treasury have done it exceptionally well to make sure that each time there are reforms, they come to our province, we sit, we engage and we put it a full house engagement. Lastly, let us make preferential procurement regulations of 2017 alive in action. To have public procurement used to drive inclusive growth and in, uh, uh, economic transformation, it starts from us. If we don't do it as the SEM practitioners, nobody will. Lastly, with the constraints of resources that we have, colleagues, we can make a difference. It's true, we've got 
due to COVID budget, it's cut down left, right, and center. We don't have the warm bodies that we want, but we can make a difference under the circumstance. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zita, for really that eye-opening uh, presentation, providing us with those practical tips and challenges um, that you're facing, as well as the recommendations um, that you are experiencing and seeing live. What I'd like to suggest now is that to go around the room and ask if anyone has any questions for Mr. Zita. I have noted that there are questions in the chat box, which I will um, highlight to, to you, Mr. Zita. But at this juncture, if anybody would like to take themselves off mute and ask uh, questions to Mr. Zita, I will take those questions now. Ayanda, I have a question. This is Tilam Kulise. Thank you, Tina. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Hassani. Um, let me first start by appreciating you for an excellent um, presentation. It has been quite practical. And I love the reflections that you have made, um, you know, in terms of your practical experience. So that has been quite interesting. But I also just want to find out what are your views around the Supreme Court of Appeal? a judgment that declared the triple PFA um, regulations as invalid on the basis that the minister exceeded his powers in making those regulations as they are inconsistent with the triple PFA. Earlier, you said that, um, you know, the triple PFA of 2017, for example, was a game changer, and indeed it was. But um, what are your reflections now, given this judgment? Are we going back to our modest um, strategies, you know, in terms of um, redressing the past. That will be my first question, um, Hassani. I have a second one. I don't know if you'll allow me to ask that one so that you attend to both questions at the same time. Ayanda, can I ask the second one as well? Please go ahead, Tina. Yes. Okay. And then on the issue of subcontracting, I also wanted to just understand um, who then takes accountability or responsibility for the performance issues uh, for those uh, subcontractors? I understand that in one of your subcontracts that you've uh, put in place, um, you've actually appointed a strategic supplier, but you've actually put in uh, eight subcontract subcontractors as well. So I just wanted to understand the Hassani, who then takes responsibility and accountability for the performance and um, how safe is it really uh, to implement a such process uh, in our contracts? Thanks. That will be all from my side. Thank you. Mr. Zita, would you like to answer? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Tina, the, I, I like your, your question around the judgment by the Supreme Court. And I, I take it with, uh, with pride that we are challenged. I'm proud of, the, of, the, of, the, of that challenge. The reason why I'm saying I'm proud, it's the intention of the regulations of 2017 shows that as government, we have taken a deliberate, a well thought position to be seen practical of advancing designated groups in terms of making sure that we use legislative framework to guide us that. And it will be, it would have been a mistake, Tina, that it should have gone through without a challenge. Remember what it does. If you look at the regulations of 2017, you look at the, regu uh, the, the regulation that talks to uh, pre-qualification. There is an, that is a conversation that goes on. When you talk about these uh, regulations of 2017, you are putting, you are doing a reverse of what was done by apartheid. You are favoring certain uh, groups of persons instead of other groups of persons. 
and it would have taken me by surprise if we would have gone through without a, 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 a challenge to the courts. And I can tell you, we engaged in the Mpopo as Limpopo Provincial, led by the Mpopo Provincial Treasure in terms of what is the implication of this? Because we're saying we need to be, I don't wanna use the word radical, but we need to be robust. If we have to be taken to the courts, so be it. And we go and defend our position because if we don't do that as government, we'll continuously be taken aback while implementing these glorious intentions to make sure that inclusive growth is protected, inclusive growth is advanced. So let, let there be court processes. We allow them to take, to, take, to take place and that enables us to look and reflect how best can we address this matter without touching on the painful cons of other groups of persons that can take us to court. And to me, uh, Tina, I can't wait to see that process being taken to finality because it's testing how serious, how robust and how committed are we as government to defend our position, to advance and protect our designated groups. Because if we don't do that, if they defend us, we become scared and turn back. We'll never drive inclusive growth. We'll never use a public procurement fit for its purpose as enshrined in section 217, subsection two of the constitution. So I can't wait to see that Amanda taking through, being put to finality. I must confess to you, uh, uh, Tina, even in Limpopo, we have been taken to court in terms of the procurement processes that we put. And when we come out, it's concluded and we, we, we come up smiling, you say, wow, it means our processes can stand the test of time, even if it's taken before the court of law. Then it means there is something good that we're doing. There is something that we are touching that's causing a stay in the public space. Subcontracting, who takes accountability for the performance? I will talk back again to our practical experience. When we set out a transversal contract for travel management services, we looked at these dynamics as we're doing our research. But how are we going to make sure that number one, it's not only about uh, Tina, about uh, who takes accountability and also the, the issue of performance. It's also about issues that we have to deal with and address it. How do we make sure that we protect subcontractors? If we're saying 30% of the project, of the budget of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the contract must go to these service providers who have been subcontracted. How do we do that? And we have to sit, engage in a robust manner in the province. Number one, when we structured our, our, our terms of reference and also our contracting, we gave the main contractors a responsibility to support our subcontractors. So any performance that is not in good keeping, we're taking it, holding it to the main contract. And I can tell you they've done wonders in terms of supporting the subcontractors. And in terms of how do we, I'm adding another leg, which you did not raise. How do we protect the subcontractors? And what we said is, let's, because we know our provincial space, we know how many departments are there. We know the budget for this particular commodity per department. Let's control it from that space. Let's try to look at categorizing these departments into, a, what, what would I call it? We, we divide these departments in such a way that we are able to allocate, you say, sub, subcontractor number one will be allocated one, two, three departments. We have looked at their, the, 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 the spend of the departments and their budget with regard to the commodity. Subcontractor two, we allocate those de departments until all the subcontractors and also 
allocate departments to the main contractors. And in this regard, it's when departments have to issue a purchase order for subcontractor, it does not go to the main contractor. It goes directly to the subcontractor. When they have to pay, it goes directly to the subcontractor. The payment goes directly to subcontractor. And that's how we, 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 we made sure we put a control environment to make sure that we protect our SMEs. And we have instances where our subcontractors had some challenges. We call our main contractors, we sit around with them. Some of the challenges, they are posed to us by the main, main contractors, I'm sorry. They are posed by main contractors and they are coming with solutions on how to support the subcontractors. In terms of how safe that is, Tina, it will never be safe until you conduct a research prior going on tender. All what I'm talking about, clustering these departments into groups for saying subcontractor one will be awarded, will be allocated to this department, subcontractor to this department, main contractors, the following departments, just like that. That was expressed clearly as is in our terms of work. It's not something that will scratch your head at the award phase. The terms of reference have to go out as such. Bidders need to know upfront. Evaluation committee will get the criterion clear set. The adjudication committee will get it like that. And that guides us as well when we draft service level agreements and the service levels. Thanks, Ayanda. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to just go to one question that is uh, on the chat, which is, is linked to your response. And this question comes from Sibongile uh, Shongwe, where she says, in your view, why does, why does the legislation not get amended to address some of the socioeconomic objectives uh, to stimulate economic growth? Uh, Sibon Gileshon, well, good afternoon. And thanks for your question. The, that is the question that as practitioners, we are heavy. Because when you, 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 you do, or you, up, you update, or you, you put together a particular legislation, that legislation is set to address a particular problem that we are facing as a country. In this case, we have designated groups that we need to advance and protect towards inclusive growth. When we engaged with National Treasury at a time when they were uh, engaging us on some other legislative reforms, we'll ask questions to say, but why are we not moving with speed to get this done? And that is the question that we're asking ourselves as procurement practitioners or supply chain uh, uh, practitioners, but because we know where the problem is, why don't we go there and fix it? And that is a, a, a question that remained to be answered, which I'm afraid I will not be able to answer because if it was within my reach, I can tell you, we know where the problem is. We know what needs to be done. We even know what, how can we do it to make sure that the legislation the legislative framework regulating public sector supply chain, it becomes an enabler and not a compliance issue. And I so wish Sbongile that I can sit on my table today and start drafting these documents because we know what to do as supply chain management practitioners. And we so wish when we wake up tomorrow, legislations would have been enacted, would have been amended to enable us as SM practitioners to use supply chain management as fit for its purpose. Thanks. Thank you for that. I'm gonna also allow an opportunity for anyone to take themselves off the mic and ask a question before I go back to the questions in the chat. Um, Ayanda, may I come in? It's Pongine speaking. Yes, please. I've asked, I know you've, you, 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 you read my question and not completed it. And I think uh, Mr. Zita answered 
what actually I was, what we know. And I said there that in, it is my belief, I want to believe that the government knows what the issues are, because I believe that uh, Mr. Zita, as supply chain professionals, various papers and, and submissions have been presented to come. So my question is, you know, why do we think, why, why, what do you think in your view, because you're closer in government, why do you think, why is government not actually addressing this issue? Thank you, Subongila. I, I wish I could have an appropriate answer for that. But remember, when you deal with legislation, especially, you'll agree with me, public procurement space, it's a highly contested terrain. And for to come up with a decision that we're amending a legislation that you have to change supply chain management space, there are a lot of considerations that have to be taken across. And it does not, it's not a process that can necessarily start today and end tomorrow as we would like. Clearly set or captured by Tina, the judgment, the Supreme Court of Appeal, the decisions there. You can tell before you go through a particular process of putting up a legislation, there are a lot of background checks. There are a lot of consultative processes that have to be taken care of, not necessarily at an administrative perspective, but it starts from the legislative perspective because there has to be a political will in putting together a particular legislation. There has to be that consensus to say at a political perspective, this is the direction that we need to do. This is South Africa. You've got multi-party state. So the engagements are not only driven from that positive approach, you still have engagement that need to contest which you thought is a glorious decision to take. So I believe, I for one, that might be amongst the other issues that are, that are derailing the expedition of processes of putting or enacting or amending legislations to enable us to do our work with ease as supply chain management practitioners. But agree with me, Sibongin, I know you know this very well. You are just asking the question to get my view. Putting a legislation, look at what's happening now. We started with the... <clears throat> The regulations of 2017 alone, how long did that took before it even surfaced in a public space where we need to be engaged by national treasury to make inputs and comments? It took a long time, but what we are crying for as practitioners, it's we so wish all these consultative processes that happens at the background before a document is published can happen so swiftly so that when it comes to a public domain for comments, it moves swiftly again, it be concluded. I so wish that I can write a paper, Subongile, with you, Subongile Shongwe, to investigate how this, why this is taking so long. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zita. I'm going to look at um, George Daniel asked a question in the chat. Do you do you also make use of the DTI National Industrial Participation Directive in designing the strategic procurement? Sorry, I just lost the question. Sorry. In designing the strategic procurement. Uh, Mr. Uh, approaches, sorry. So the question was, do you make use of the DTI National Industrial DTI National Industry Participation Directive in designing the strategic uh, procurement approaches that you use? Yes. That was a very easy answer. <laughs> it's, very, it's very easy because those directives are very clear, you need to comply with. And apart from the two transversal contracts that I gave an example of, We've got our provincial departments that are arranging their own individual contracts. And this is part of the deliberations that we have on quarterly basis when they are reporting on the, their, their operations in terms of the tenders that they have advertised, in terms of the tenders that they are awarded. One of the critical deliverables that they are reporting there is compliance with DTI instructions. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to once again invite people to take themselves off the mic before I go back to some of the questions in the chat. 
Are there any questions? Okay. In the thanks, absence. Thanks, okay. Professor. Yes. Yes. yes uh, my name is Walter Maliano. And I want to appreciate uh, Mr. Zita for a comprehensive presentation that he has made. Um, I think um, it goes a long way into empowering SEM professionals. Uh, though he opted to call them practitioners, we, in the professionalization space, we call them professionals. So I would want him to start um, acquainting himself to the term professionals when he called SEM practitioners. Uh, my question, uh, Mr. Zita, it's uh, relating to your targets. Um, don't you think that uh, the targets with regard to what we have uh, put as the provincial treasury or as the uh, province, uh, Limpopo, regarding the 60% uh, for black owned enterprises and 3% uh, for cooperative, it's very low. Uh, looking at the fact that uh, the province is predominantly black, the majority of, of, of um, citizens that lives in Limpopo are black. And secondly, it's because um, the province has been um, using cooperative as means to bring the black people into mainstream, particularly young people. So I, I view it uh, when you look at the target for 2030 to say um, with the target of 30 of 60% for black on enterprises, I think it's a bit low. I, I would really wish that you really increase that target. But the, the second one, it's with regard to what you've called um, game changer prescripts or regulations that uh, you indicated that you view them as game changers. I, I want to bring to your attention that one of the black lobby group called Black Management Forum has really, um, dispel the notion that the PPR 2017 has brought into it the, the empowerment of black people and therefore they will really want to want those that are litigating the ministry to win the case because it does not achieve its intentions or intended intentions. Therefore, I would really want you to advise the Black Management Forum and uh, quantify in terms of the beneficiation that you are able to pull from your data with regard to what the provinces achieved. So that then that starts to convince the black boys achieved with regard to my, my apologies, uh, Mr. Zita. With regard to the achievement of the PPR relating to empowerment of black owned enterprises. Thanks. Over to you, Dr. Ted. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I am so excited to receive or to learn that part of the guest in attendance is GIZ. Mr. Malayan, welcome. The issue of uh, our, our targets would have so wished that we will set the targets higher. Remember, this was the beginning of the start from our side. And when we work out this, uh, when we set these targets, we're looking at the, the, the enabling environment that will assist us to move towards this. Remember, we are not, we still have limitations of advertising tenders and say these tenders, it's for, for black people. We're not allowed to put a tender like that. We have to live by what the, 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 the framework is giving us. And also same is the issue of cooperatives. We, we, when we started it, we, we, we have to be realistic to ourselves and looking at the limitations that we have within the legislative framework, that if we set these targets too high, you go on tender, Mr. Malayan, you know it very well. We go out on tender and you get anybody to participate because we can't discriminate. And out of that, you will still find other service providers who are falling outside this designated group that we have mentioned that qualify for, uh, for to, to win. And you can uh, uh, simply uh, ignore that because you will be, be deemed to be non-compliant in terms of the, the laws or the framework. 
But I agree with you that when you look at where we are, we are predominantly black in Limpopo. And again, you can't set East in Limpopo. It's, 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 it's very catchy, but as believe me, we have noted this, Mr. Manayan, and I note it again, that we, as the enabling environment, as our legislative framework tends towards an enabling environment, that will enable us to look, to reflect on these targets and put them ahead because we will be certain that the legislative framework, it's there as an enabler to make sure that we do, we achieve what we want to achieve. My game changer legislation, PPR of 2017. You are putting a nice point, uh, Mr. Malaya, there in terms of the lobby group. And we all know what a lobby group is. And we, for you to be, to be, to, to be confident in terms of what the lobby group is lobbying against, you need to check who is the lobby group representing? What are they fighting for? Are they really black? Are they really not representing other groups within themselves? Because I will tell you why. When uh, uh, the regulations came in, when the triple PFA was, uh, was enacted, there was also, though it was not at this level of engagement where we are today, whereby there was this point of say, but what is it all about? You're saying 80, 20 and 90, 10. That was the a, 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 a discourse going at a time. What will 20% do out of 80? What will 10% do out of 90? If a bidder who has been around who was a B was beaten in the in the era of the, the apartheid era, uh, with a mass of uh, of ex experience and financial capabilities. If he, that bidder beats with Zeta HE Business Enterprise, automatically that bidder will get eight points. That was the argument at that time. What is the use of H twenty? Automatically, if our SMEs have to compete with such an enterprise, always ninety. Uh, 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 points for price, they will beat us flat down because we don't have the muscles, the economic uh, financial muscles that they have. And there was that uproar. But look at where we are today in terms of making sure that that 80 20, that 90 10, it shapes the procurement space. And it did, though we still wish that we can have it taken to another level. Responding to your question my advice. I so wish that the lobby group, their interest is not only about nullifying the regulations of 2017, but putting pressure to government. You can do more. Not only allowing us to subcontract youth, women, people with disabilities, military veterans, but allow us to put a pre-qualification, allow us to bring first budget and say this budget, it's only for people living with disability. Use this act to allow us to ring first budget for our military veterans, youth and women. I, I so believe that they might be using that to push government to go to where we want in terms of Nabbing it by the butt because we know what's wrong, but we are, the pace of addressing it might not be as speedily as we expect. So I so wish that I can, I can engage with that lobby group, uh, Mr. Malaya, just to understand who they are. But my advice to them is they will be, I will consider them a little bit taking us backwards if they are lacking appreciative tone in their conversation, in their argument, in terms of what National Treasury has done when it comes to the PPR of 2017. But if they can say, we appreciate what we are doing, but we are supporting people that are taking you to court because we think we have not done much enough. You need to add one, two, three, four. You need to expedite. 
I will support them 100%, Mr. Malaya. Thank you. Ayanda? Ayanda? Thank you very much for that. I'm going to once again ask if there are any anyone else would like to take themselves off the mic and ask a question. I'm also noting the time that we have uh, eight minutes before we need to close. If there's no one um, coming off the mic, I'm just going to read a comment coming from Mr. Songwan in the chat where he says, thank you for the insightful presentation. The passion, the passion on, um, on SCM development, its impact on the economy and your practical approach. Once again, I've lost your practical approach in the implementation of the I've lost the question again. Apologies, Mr. Songwan, because I liked, sorry, the its impact on the economy and your practical approach in the implementation of SC, uh, within the SCM space. We need robust solutions as government, and this can only happen once SCM is regarded. And now I can't see the rest of the question. Sorry for that, Mr. Songwan. Would you like to? make your comment because I actually liked that you were really talking to the presentation and talking to professionalization um, and really talking to what the Interim uh, Council on Supply Chain Management is doing. So Mr. Tlongwane was really just um, uh, praising you and, and saying to keep up the good work because he was noting your, your passion uh, in terms of that. H having yes. said that, uh, Having said that, I'm going to ask again if there are any other questions um, <clears throat> one would like to ask. Um, I see you, Heidi, saying very insightful and, and thank you, Mr. Zita, for his time. Thank you, Heidi, for that comment. Anyone else would like to ask questions? Um. Mr. Zita, I will take you off. I'll take you up on an offer that we write a paper regarding why the change of legislation is not happening soon. Because in my view, we can say it takes long, like we explained. We know that an act takes long to change. But really, I think we need to look beyond. We need to look how long has this happened and the, the trillions that have been spent that we could have at least injected in assisting uh, boosting our economy or addressing social economic activities, we can see that continuing with this act, at least I would say, uh, if something had started, yes, we know it takes long. If something had started, maybe some movement had started that we say, yes, we know it takes long, but our government, you know, it shows that our government is moving to, you know, to a point or to the direction where we want to go, but unless if I've been blind, I've not seen anything that uh, you know tells me we are working towards that other than the procurement bill or supply chain bill that we're working on, but which will still be implemented based on this legislation. So I'm like, is this counterproductive or where are we going to, will we see this change in our lifetimes or is it something that our children or our children's children do, will do? So yeah, thank you. Sibongile, thank you very much. Uh, I've already have a, 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 a topic for our paper, which will be more interested in investigating why there is such a, 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 a kind of appetite. We'll describe it, uh, Sibongile, whether it's a low appetite or a, a lukewarm appetite in government in expediting the reforms within the legislative environment. I'll agree with you, Sibongile. If you look at how much government is dispersing through public sector procurement, if legislation can be done in such a way that it enables us, I can tell you this can take us too far as a society. You look at how much is allocated to the local provincial government and check other provinces as well. Each and every province have its own socioeconomic dynamics that needs to be responded to. 
And as long as we don't have a, 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 a fast move on these aspects, it will remain a subject that needs to be discussed again in all these boardrooms, but without practical implementation. And I'm still ready, Sbongile, uh, uh, that we engage offsite this. Thanks. Thank you very much. At this juncture, we have three minutes before uh, five o'clock. I will ask if there's anyone who has a last burning question uh, before I close the session. If there's none, I would really like to um, take this opportunity to really thank Mr. Peter. I'm looking through the comments here and we have comments from like, for example, Ronald Mlalazi, who says, Zita, thank you for the thought-provoking presentation and the intended strategy to implement strategic procurement. Well done. I think he really does echo um, our sentiments in terms of really providing us with uh, th um, thought leadership, giving us practical experience in terms of what you're doing within Limpopo government and engaging uh, in terms of the questions and, and the work that you're doing. Um, you already have a co-author uh, based on this session <laughs> of uh, Sibongile. Um, so really, thank you very much um, for sharing your expertise with us. Um, for the rest of the people in the, in the room, a lot of you are asking in terms of where can we get presentation, where can we get the recording? Um, it's available in terms of at the website of ISCA, which is www.iska.org.za, um, where you can have access to the recording as, as well as the presentation. It looks like, Mr. Zita, there's really great interest uh, going forward. And I would like to thank you uh, once again for participating in our second uh, Game Changer uh, event. And that I'll hand over to you for maybe some last parting words before we say goodbye to everyone. Mr. Zita. Uh, Ayanda, thank you very, 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 very much for facilitating this uh, series very well. And to the coordinators, uh, to me, as long as we have this continuous session whereby uh, supply chain management uh, professionals. I'm correcting myself. I'm doing autocorrect, Mr. Malayan. Thank you very much. Where supply chain management uh, professionals are given a space to share the good work that we are doing. Really, you come in our offices, you look at what we are doing. We are now working remotely. You visit us remotely to check what we are doing. We, 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 we work around the clock. But we don't have a space whereby as professionals will come out and say, this is the good work that we are doing. And believe me, if that space, ISCA is not uh, being proud of it, taking it by the horns to give us a space, we share our practical base experience. The opposite will happen. Those that are very good in putting, pushing a negative narrative, will continuously dominate the space. You'll check on the website, you'll see negative things about public sector procurement. Why? We don't have a space as professionals within SCM space where we come in and say, look, this is what we are doing. We are not there yet, but we are, we are, we are putting efforts. Ayanda, I can talk another hour again because this is close to my heart. Thank you very much. To all the people in at the guests in attendance, thank you very much. I received the questions in good faith, some were comments, and I will still go engage, digest them further, because there's a lot more in each question that was uh, ushered to me. Ayanda and all the guests and the coordinators, thank you very much. Have a blessed evening going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zita. And thanks to everybody who joined. We will see you again at the next Game Changer, which is on the 29th of June, 2021. Thank you and good evening, everybody. Thank you, bye. Evening, I can say, I can say, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, I know your voice.
<laughs> Thanks, Thanks. Kelly. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you.